Thank you, uh, Chairs and Organising Committee, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this area and uh, compare and contrast it to the surgical talk and the uh, radiotherapy talk as evolving technologies. Um, I wanted to start off by really trying to conceptualise um, where these different technologies can, use, uh, can be used and what their limitations are. So in terms of uh, my disclosures, um, in terms of looking at the areas we have to deal with, the first thing to do is, if you're a medical oncologist, which I am, is to think about what chemotherapy can't achieve. So in this context, we're now moving into more and more systemic chemotherapy. We're up to triplets and quadruplets. Uh, we're looking at toxicity issues, quality of life, cost. And are we really getting increased complete response rates? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And, and are we getting durable responses? Historically, when you got to this sort of level of three or four drugs, you ended up not being able to build on this platform. And so this combination biological era will make triplets and quadruplets very difficult to integrate. The paradox also is that you want um, deeper and quicker responses, and some of these triplets and quadruplets do that. But there's also an approach where you're looking at quality of life and you're de-escalating therapy. So you have to build all these factors in and think about the unmet needs that chemotherapy leaves. When you look at eradicating liver tumors, apart from increasing chemotherapy, you can think of three categories. One which is visually targeted, and that means really that um, you have two options of that. One which has already been spoken of and is on my next slide is a group of uh, technologies. But the common ones that we have are interventional, which essentially mean needles. So in a simplistic way of thinking about it, you have to do this radiologically, intraoperatively, um, but there are lots of tools and kits and 13 or 14 different ways of doing radiofrequency ablation with different companies. There's microwave, there's IRE, and there are going to be many more. But the limitation of these are the fact that you have to stick a needle in something, you have to visualize it, and you have to assume that you're going to be able to eradicate what you see and, and hope there isn't a lot of what you can't see. So you have a similar issue with what we've just heard, and I'm just going to briefly go through this because essentially what you're doing is external uh, targeting, and they can be grouped into uh, two broad groups. Um, the one caveat, uh, although they're non, uh, sorry, the, what, the one caveat that although they're not um, invasive in that sense is in some contexts like CyberKnife, you do need to put fiducials, and in, certainly in our institute that has been a problem uh, of the placement of fiducials. Then we come to what really what I'm going to speak about today, which is the concept of trying to not target individual metastases like a surgeon or those two other technology groups would do, but try and think of an organ and try and target the whole organ. And so this could be considered an organ targeted or a regional treatment, and there's different ways of doing this. You could deliver a cytotoxic agent to a higher concentration with hepatic arterial infusion and portal vein. And this is very interesting and is being re-understood in terms of certain situations, uh, although I won't talk about it in detail today. You can give uh, five or few or derivatives and you can give other drugs. More um, uh, recently, however, in the last 10 or, 10 or 12 years, we've moved from using embolization techniques, which are bland, which means we're looking for infarction, ischemia, and loading drugs onto the beads. Of course, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in my subsequent uh, slides. So what you're doing here is combining embolization with chemotherapy. And then, of course, we'll spend some time now talking also about selective internal radiation. Just for the record, there are different names for this. There's brachytherapy, there's transarterial radioembolization, there's radioembolization. Uh, and these are, by and large, yttrium-90 loaded spheres. And there's two uh, main uh, uh, companies that make it. One is resin and one is glass. And they have different characteristics, which I won't go into too much detail today. So just quickly to say that there has been a long evolution of evidence, which when you put all the data together and you give drugs through the hepatic artery or portal vein, that you do get a small incremental benefit in uh, endpoints that we would consider meaningful. And you could argue that's roughly around 5 to 10% improvement in local control and potentially survival. When you look at arterial particle comparisons, you have to understand that they have different aims. So the Y90 microspheres are of the range of under 35 microns, and they're small. 
and the, the embolic beads which are looking for infarction and ischemia are generally over 100 microns. And the goal of the small beads is to implant into the tumor, and the goal of the larger beads is to cause ischemia and infarction and block all the blood supply. And this is depicted here in, in a diagrammatic form. You can see where these beads lodge, and you have taste for the ones which are lodging proximally and causing a, a major uh, a blockage of blood supply, and then you've got implantation into the tumor of the radiation beads. The procedures, um, for those of you who are not familiar, are in most hospitals are now carried as day procedures or an overnight procedure, and essentially it's an uh, it's, uh, uh, injection into the hepatic artery uh, through the groin. Process takes about one to two hours in terms of a preparatory process, which we call uh, the diagnostic angiogram, and, and then about a week or two later, depending on where you live, you can actually do, deliver the therapy after you've prepared the liver by blocking off all the collaterals with coil embolization. So this is an example of the radiation fields. I'm not a radiation biologist, and, and after 10 years in this field, I still don't understand this, this uh, concept of this uh, 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 radiation delivery. What I can tell you is that there are two characteristics which are very attractive. One is that yttrium-90 essentially gives out beta radiation and very high doses uh, up to about 2.5 millimeters, possibly as, uh, uh, as, as high as 1.5 centimeters, but most of the dose drops off about 11 millimeters. So this is the way that you would perceive it if you were uh, watching this in a video and you were watching this in real time through simulation, through, through post-surgical samples. You get random association of the beads in the way that they, they, they lodge. And you get these overlaps, but you also get areas of sparing. And the areas of overlaps carry very, very high dosing. And dosing, which essentially causes lethality. So if you take out a, 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 a surgical sample after CERT, you will find that it's very difficult to find viable cells close to the beads. You also have this interesting thing called a crossfire or collateral effect, which I'll just maybe spend uh, one or two minutes uh, talking about. So what you're trying to do in these contexts, both, both these technologies, is you're tr in, in the co context of radiation, you're trying to give radiation to the tumor. If you have chemotherapy on the bead or you have chemotherapy systemically, you can try and synergize if you're giving radiation. You try and increase the tumor kill. And then you might also get a bit of avascular tumor kill. And this is a problem for chemotherapy because generally micrometastases below one to two millimeters are generally avascular. So you can't deliver. It's very difficult to deliver chemotherapy to those um, small micrometastases. And what we still don't know in colorectal cancer, which is opposite to what we know in hepatocellular cancer, is that we don't know whether the infarction and ischemia actually contributes. And therein lies the difference between giving chemoembolization and radioembolization. Now we move to the clinical trials data. I'm pleased to report that because this field has been evolving, we have got some very large data sets. Historically, most of the studies will show benefit. There's a publication bias, but endpoints that are reported are very difficult to understand, as I'll, I'll show you on the next slide. They all increase response rates. They all appear to be safe in different situations, but interpretation of the studies is very difficult. And for those of you who've been through the clock study design, and I was involved in Fox Fry and Surflox design, these are very complex multimodal uh, 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 trials, but they are deliverable, as you can see. So this is a f one of the first studies that was reported, which was uh, designed to give chemoembolization with irinotecan loaded beads. It was a randomized controlled trial versus, uh, so two, uh, on average, two intrahepatic uh, uh, deliveries um, versus systemic uh, uh, Folfox and Bevacizumab, although the patients were also allowed to have Folfox uh, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, Dibiri arm. And this is a real problem. So this study gets reported. There are 70 patients. The randomization is on 60. The, tr the uh, screening population is over 360. And there are no survival curves. I, it's very rare to see publications without survival curves. And, and you really need to understand that the communities that are uh, medical oncology trained or rigorously trained in clinical trials will obviously question this. 
And then some of the actual reporting standards are extremely uh, difficult to interpret. So for instance, the response rates are reported at two, four, and six months. So when we're designing these studies, what we have to do is we have to change our reporting standards to what's, what's actually acceptable. And unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, the rigorous nature we've done clinical trials with drugs is the highest standard we can adhere to. And love it or leave it, we've got to stick by it. So this is another study that was published by uh, an Italian group. And again, it shows a survival difference of two cycles of Dabiri given into the liver versus Folfiri but it is only um, 70 patients. I brought this slide up really to show you that they were highlighting also that these things are actually cheaper than giving chemotherapy. So this is the cost that they came up for in the paper. I've also quoted you verbatim what they quoted in the paper, that six months of treatment with Folfox bevacizumab can cost up to 90,000 euros. And with two cycles of Dabiri, the authors are, are, are showing that you can get quite good disease control uh, to, that impacts overall survival. Now, what about CERT? Well, CERT has many studies. There are 50 studies, but I'm not going to talk about any of them. I'm going to talk about three pivotal studies which led to the big randomized trials. And the first one was that if you deliver intrahepatic uh, 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 5-FU or, or FUDR and you combine it with CERT, this was an old study, it showed synergy. There was then the randomized trial, which I'll show you the data of from the Belgian group. And there was a phase one study, which is when I got involved, which was to try and see whether you could synergize with systemic chemotherapy, which was logical for radiotherapy studies. There's also um, uh, the, um, uh, the trial, which was the Belgian trial, I just wanted to point out, also allowed the uh, use of this in refractory disease to get into the ESMO guidelines currently. And in the UK, we're allowed to use it in refractory setting uh, for NICE, through NICE. Now, this is the, uh, the pivotal trial that led to the big randomized studies combined with Folfox 4. Response rate was reported, only 20 patients. Certainly exciting, but has to move on to a big randomized study, which it did. In fact, it moved into two randomized studies. And this was the Belgian study, which was the first time that we actually had a reporting uh, uh, outcome from a proper randomization, very difficult to do in, in refractory patients. Protracted 5-FU with or without CERT. About 50% of the patients got crossover but their primary endpoint, which was time to liver progression, uh, was still significantly different, suggesting that there was a benefit uh, to giving certain refractory patients. This is the big trial that you're all familiar with, both in this meeting, ASCO previously, and, and, and other ESMO meetings. This has been presented in detail. I just want to go through a couple of points I wanted to make. So the, just to remind everyone that this was a study powered for progression-free survival. There were 530 patients and they were allowed to have uh, Folfox to start off with on both arms, have CERT in one arm, in preferably the first or second cycle, and then to have Bevacizumab ad added as a protocol amendment when it came through the system in the individual countries after the cycle four. And that's depicted here. The dose of the oxaloplatin is reduced in the first three cycles, and that was based on the phase one study uh, by, Sharma, by Ricky Sharma, and then it was increased uh, at, uh, if it was safe to increase after that, and the bevacizumab was added in cycle four. So the idea of this study, and this is why it's so difficult to predict what's going to happen, is to get this type of patient. So we were hoping that there would be uh, four plus more the liver mets, inoperable, potentially operable, but then not converted maybe, um, or some centers saying, well, this is a better study than patients who are on the bad end of that spectrum, 10 metastases, for instance, because randomized trials in this group are really lacking. However, when you look at the study, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, criteria that we actually had, the demographics, we actually got this group. And this group was a liver predominant group. In the Surflox study, 80, 85% uh, either had their primary in situ throughout their disease when they were being treated, uh, or they had extra hepatic disease. 90, up to, it was between 86 and 90%, depending on which arm you looked at, had synchronous metastases. So just bearing in mind that we are looking at a group that we didn't really want in the study, um, how we interpret the data is still open to question. So the primary endpoint of the Surflox study was progression-free survival, and it did not show an advantage. 
There is, however, uh, a badge of safety that it did not compromise the patients in any way, uh, despite the reduction in oxaliplatin dose, despite the fact that bevacizumab was added in cycle four and the added potential toxicity of CERT. This was actually uh, what the uh, secondary analysis looks at, and it just tells you that these technologies do what they say on the label which is that you can delay progression in the target organ. In this case, it was uh, just under eight months, uh, uh, but this is uh, unclear as to what this has an as, whether it has an impact on the overall survival of these patients. So the other interesting thing which I talked about earlier was the completeness, uh, the, uh, the complete response rate, and these technologies definitely have a higher complete response rate, which again may or may not be of interest in terms of the clinical utility. The final thing I want to point out in this study is that the patients uh, uh, who were uh, intended to be treated with bevacizumab in the countries where it was available and they got the bevacizumab or they didn't get the bevacizumab, the good news is whether you look at the additional benefit of CERT or you look at the addition of bevacizumab, both uh, improved outcomes independent of which arm the patients were on. So that's quite an important point in terms of deliverability of a standard of care regimen to patients who've had CERT in the first line setting. So we're moving to an overall survival analysis, which will probably take about another 18 months. The reason we can do that is because another study is completed, which uh, I'm a co-chief investigator of, the FOXFAR study, um, and combined with an extension of the, of the uh, SURFLOC study, we will have 1,020 patients where it's powered and, and pre-planned for overall survival. There are other studies going on. Uh, the uh, glass microspheres, which is a different technology, have a different loading characteristic. It's generally hotter in, in radiation terms. Uh, um, do have mo more HCC studies, but the middle study there, the EPOC study, is recruiting. It's, a, it's an end of first line, early second line study. Now, there are differences between certain tastes that have been analyzed in different ways. You can look at toxicities. You can look at complications. I just wanted to point out two things on this busy slide. The real difference is that chemoembolization can usually only cover a small area of the liver, and therefore you need repeated treatments. So in the HCC studies, uh, uh, patients were treated up to six times. In a lot of colorectal studies, they have two or three treatments, and the hospital stays are longer as a consequence because they all get prehydration and, 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 and general anesthesia in some hospitals to give the, to give the Dibiri, for instance. The second difference uh, is really this embolic syndrome, which reflects in the, in, the, in the duration of stay. So an embolic syndrome leads to pyrexia, leads to pain, which can be two, three, four, five days uh, after the syndrome. When you look at costs, we have looked at the difference between this. We've published a paper on this. And the cost is pretty comparable for the two technologies on a one-to-one -one basis. With CERT, you either have one or two treatments, depending on the lobes. With Dibiri, you can have two treatments, but in a lot of centers, this will be also repeated. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is these emerging technologies are going to be integrated with ev an evidence base, and we have to find out how these are going to help. They look like they have limited clinical benefit in terms of organ, but there are studies with negative PFS, clock study, FIRE 3, that went on to have um, very large overall survival benefits. And this might be because of what you've heard in this and other conferences, that these debulking strategies may be giving deeper responses, higher complete response rates, and earlier tumor shrinkage. So all these things may be at play, but the value of organ control is still up for uh, discussion. The phase three trials will also have quality of life and safety, and in the SURFLOC study, which had 560 patients, the safety was very acceptable. Thank you very much.